congratulations on this brand new album. Um, when I took a listen to this album, I absolutely fell in love with it straight away. So congratulations. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. One of the things that hit me with your career is that every time you release an album, your music just gets better and better and better. I was wondering, how does that happen for you? Like, do you go into every album wanting to do better than the album before? How how does that process work for you? Well, you always try to. You know, the, the I um, it, it's I, I genuinely believe that that you you're only as good as your next album. You know, that the, this this thing about living on past glories and, and so on. I, I think that's that sucks pretty badly you know i think if you want a, a long career then you should earn it you know and and you should be willing to sink or swim on every new album that you make so so there is that desire to want to make each one better than the one before or as good as you know ideally ideally better and i haven't always done it you know I, I, i've made one or two stinkers for sure a bit when the um you know the, you know, the creativity is is not a full on tap at all, at all times. You know, there are, there are there are periods in your life when you're just not as good. You just, you just don't have the great ideas that you, you know, that you sometimes have at other times. So you have to you know, you're a bit aware of that. You know, you, you you live in fear of that all the time. But that certainly happened to me sort of towards the end of the eighties, early nineties. I did did some pretty average records then but I've, I've always tried you know i've always tried to do the best i could at, at, at any given time and i think of late um well actually not of late really well with 94 I did, I did an album called sacrifice which took me in a fairly in a sort of a much heavier direction than what i've been in before that and i really loved it and i was really happy with it um and i pretty much been on that kind of path ever since really just been trying to get better at it but i do feel the pressure of it i i, I do feel the pressure of having to come up with you know good ideas constantly for your whole life but but that is that is what it means you know if you want to have a long career then that's what you have to do because every every year every album you make there are other people out there really good you know really good songwriters new people coming along you know other people have been around for a while that are very talented and when you just try to do your best, you know, uh, uh, at, every, at every turn, really, and just hope that when you go into the studio, that the ideas are actually there, you know, because as, as I say, that they're not, they're not always, you know, sometimes they're not. It's yeah. A bit of a worry. What puts you in that creative space? Is there something that you can do that kind of puts you into that space where you know that you're going to get your best work? No, not really. Um, I. I I got to say, actually, when the when the children first came along, before the children actually came along, I would I, I had the luxury of all the time in the world, you know, so I could go into a studio and it would regularly take me, you know, the best part of the first day to just kind of tune out the world and tune in to where you needed your brain to be to start to get everything going. I I always thought that was a very necessary process. And then the children come along, and I had no time. And I struggled quite a bit for a few years there. You know, I, I wasn't able to, to go into the studio, and I only had say, you know, two hours before I had to go and drop a kid to the doctors or take him back to school, her back to school, or you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Like, you know, life was very, very different when the children came along, and I really didn't do a very good job of it. And, and um, but I've learned over the years now. So now, now, I'm able to go into the studio, and if I've only got an hour or two. It's pretty much instant. I go in there, sit down, and things start to happen straight away. But I had to kind of train myself to, to do that, but out of necessity, really. But there is no, there is no special place, really. It, it's, it's just when I started, you know, when when I was in my twenties, I used to think it was necessary to be kind of down in the dumps a bit, you know, a bit miserable or, or unhappy with the world at large. That I, I thought that was necessary at the time. I don't think it was at all, really. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's difficult. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, when I started doing this, I was, what, 18, 19? Uh, and I'm 20, I'm, I'm 20, I'm 63 now. So, you know, th there's an awful lot of living and life and growing up. And, you know, you change as you get older. And things that were difficult to be, uh, 
to begin with become easier as you get older and so, some things that are easy become more difficult as you get older you, you just change you know? yeah and I, I think i've grown into doing this um so that i'm far more comfortable with it with it now than i was when i started so maybe that helps a little bit you know that, that ability to just go straight to where you need to be yeah. to write the songs um i, I think that you know that probably contributes towards it to be honest you mentioned that in the past you used to like to write when you were down in the dumps. You do have a knack of writing darker songs that become uplifting. Like Down in the Park is one of my favourite songs of all time. And even off this new album, Intruder is a dark song, but it has a very kind of uplifting personal feel to it. Um, can you explain that knack that you've got for doing that? <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> um, I have no, no idea where that comes from, but it's it's true. You know, the, the music tends to be quite quite heavy. Um, you know, both musically and lyrically, and you know, the subject matter is often pretty pretty heavy. You know, you know Down in the Park is a good example of that. I, I, it, it, Down in the Park was once labelled as doom steady. I thought that was a great way of describing. Yeah. <laughs> That pretty much applies to everything we've ever done, really. Doom steady. Um, I don't know, really. I, I don't know. I, but I do. Yeah, when I when I listen to the music, when I play it live on stage, I find it exciting. You know, I look down at the set list, and we just did a we just filmed a, a streaming gig that's going to be uh, transmitted on the seventeenth in, in a week or so. Um, and we filmed that a few weeks back, and I, I remember you know, looking down at the set list and seeing one of the intruder songs coming along, and just being, I think, oh great, you know, this is going to be great. I love this song, and so it doesn't. It, I, I don't stand on stage sort of at the end of an hour and a half, you know, sort of wringing my hands and wanting to commit suicide because it's been an hour and a half of depressing music. <laughs> you know, it, it's all been pretty, pretty exciting and big, you know, huge grooves and massive choruses, and you know. I, uh, the, the music itself doesn't feel down yep. to me. Yeah. Although it is heavy and it does sometimes have a heavy, lyri heavy lyrical content. But th th there is a way, isn't there? There, there must be. You know, there, there is a way of wrapping that together into a package which has a, a, you know, a level of excitement and energy to it and, and makes you feel good at, good at the end of it, even though it's a pretty dark subject. Definitely, yeah. And you mentioned that it was back in about 94 that your music got heavier, and it got so heavy to the point where you ended up doing a duet with, with Fear Factory. Was there something back in 94 that that flicked that switch and made you decide to do heavier music, or was, do you think it was just a, an evolution of your natural music? No, it was. That there's something did happen, actually. I did an album in 92 called Machine and Soul, which is really a big a big pile of poo to be honest it wasn't very good it was the best i could do at the time but it wasn't very good and it wasn't a, it wasn't a really a gary newman album and also in 1992 i met my wife Gemma, and that that was massively important so i'd done a really bad album which had been at the end of a very long period of not doing very good songs i, I hadn't been very happy with my music for a while and i really just stepped back from everything and started to really think about what I was doing and if I wanted to carry on doing it as a real sort of looking inside sort of period. And then I met Gemma at, at this sort of same period while that was going on. And we argued a lot about it. You know, my opinions were that the weak link in my music was me. You know, I didn't sing very well. I didn't play very well. So my, my answer to that had been to get in other singers that would sing better than me. Not the main vocal, but backing singers and so on that, that were increasingly all over the albums. To get in better guitar players and better players in general that would do a better, would make the albums more musical, more accomplished than I was able to do on my own. And I thought that was the answer to my failings. And Gemma pointed out, and it took probably the best part of a year of us arguing about this when we, when we first met, so it was all a bit awkward. But Gemma said, what you've actually done is taken out the bit that people liked. She said, you've taken the Gary Newman out of your records, but that's the bit that people got into them for in the first place. They don't want a great guitar player. They want the way you play it. And they don't want all these backing singers. They want to hear your voice. Whether you like it or not, these other people do. And it took a while for me to accept that, you know, because it takes a certain amount of ego to accept that that could possibly be true. And I didn't, I, I didn't have that. But eventually, I began to see the sense in what she was saying, 
so what with that and my own feelings about you know the problems that i've had in the past I, I i i didn't even have a record contract then you know i had no money i was massively in debt they were trying to repossess my house um as i say no record company you know i got it was just awful you know it really did seem like the career was over and dead and buried and and interestingly i i sort of gave up you know i i i didn't think i'd ever get a real good contract again didn't expect to and so i went back to making music having accepted what Gemma had said about what i've been doing wrong i went back to making music for a hobby a sacrifice was a hobby album made on a, yeah. on a not on a porter studio exactly but on a very low scale cheap home studio setup which, which is all i had left at the time i had to sell everything off and it was it was great you know going back to doing it for a hobby not listening to advice not listening to to a and r men not worried about radio player any of those sorts of things i kind of fell in love with it all again the way i had done when i was a teenager when i when i first started doing it and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed making that record. And that made me realise that I hadn't actually enjoyed making the few before that. I hadn't, I hadn't enjoyed making the albums for quite some time. And it was a it was a massive moment. It was a sort of a pivotal moment in my life and, and, and career. And so the album was, the Sacrifice album was heavier, not because of any kind of intent to make it heavier, but simply because I'd just been left to go back and do what I love doing and, and write music that I just really cared about and not trying to write music for a strategy you know to keep an A&R man happy or think about radio play or, like I said before and it was just it was so it was natural I, I naturally gravitated towards a much heavier kind of music when I did exactly what I wanted to do and stopped worrying about the career so giving up on the career was the best thing I could have done for saving the, the career and it's been great ever since then definitely uh, Gary I know we are running out of time very very quickly but there was a question I wanted to ask before I go um working with Aid Fenton that has also seemed to be a huge part of your career now this is your fifth album with him that must almost feel like a, a second marriage for you as well working with Aid what's he like to work with and what do you think he brings to your music well Aid's a genius first of all you know I, I give him these crude rough edged little demos of songs and um he turns them into these polished moments of musical clarity you, you know what he brings to it is difficult to it's, it's difficult to bring to words in a way because it, it's such a huge contribution to what's going on i mean i know i write the songs to begin with so i know i'll, I'll take some credit for that but the shape that they end up in the quality of the finished material very very much down to aid and and as a team we we work very very well together and the more albums we've, we've made to the more the, the better and more easier that relationship has become and you know the, the ability for us to be able to sort out problems and argue about things without it becoming an issue all for the good of the record you know of course um it's just got better and better and, and i i value him massively and uh, you know, I'd make sure that when you, know, when you look at the album and the credits, it says produced by Aid Fence and letters as big as my name. You know, I mean, it's really his contribution to it is enormous, and I I genuinely believe that I wouldn't be you know in the position I am now without what he's done. And I have no intention of ever using anybody else in the future. You know, I think as far whatever whatever I've got left in me as far as a career is concerned, because I am getting quite quite old now. <laughs> um, whatever, you know, whatever I do in the future, he, he'll always be a part of it. He's, he's, I'm lucky to have him. He's very, very clever. Definitely. Well, Gary, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. It has been an absolute honour. Thank you so much for all the music that you've brought to us over the years that we've loved. And again, congratulations on such a fantastic album. Thank you. Thank no you very problem. Much. Really do appreciate it. I'll let you go. Bye Have bye. a great day, and hopefully we talk again in the you. future. See you later. Okay, man. Bye. 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 bye.